Here I have the iPhone 16, 16 Pro, and 16 Pro Max. And I've got a love-hate relationship with how similar these phones are. They all feel great in the hand, super sleek, but I kind of like the regular iPhone 16 more when it comes to design. Titanium and the new desert color are cool and all, but I seriously miss the fun colors. Remember that green iPhone 13 Pro? Yeah, those were the days. The pros are a bit bigger this year. But honestly, comfort is such a personal thing. The size to buy really depends on what you're comfortable with. I've been uh, jumping between all three of these phones for a bit now. And honestly, moving from the 16 Pro Max to the regular 16 didn't feel like a downgrade at all. Like sure, the size difference is obvious, but aside from that, not much else stands out. Take the displays. Yeah, bigger is usually better. And the 16 Pro Max definitely takes the crown when it comes to sheer screen real estate. But in terms of colors, brightness, and just how smooth everything feels, the regular 16 holds its own. It still cranks out that wild 1 to 2000 nit brightness, so you won't feel like you're missing out. So for day-to-day -day use, you're golden. Now, the pro motion. Does it make a difference? Well, yes, but mostly for nerds like me who notice it. For your average user right there, it's not a big deal. I'll be honest, when I first switched from the Pro Max to the regular 16, I could feel the regular 16 was a bit more jittery without the higher refresh rate, but after a couple of days, my eyes adjusted and it was business as usual. That said, if you're used to other Apple devices with Pro Motion, like an iPad or a Mac, you will notice it's missing. So, if comfort is a priority and you want that buttery smooth feel, it might be worth shelling out for the Pro. But if you're fine with a 60 Hz now, you will probably be fine without it. Always on display is a cool feature in Pros, but I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker. I know tons of folks with a 14 Pro and 15 Pro who've turned it off anyway. And after using the regular 16 without it, I honestly didn't miss it. In fact, I kind of like the break from constant notifications. And while we are on the topic of convenience, I want to show you my new favorite toy. This thing is called Plod Note. This little device is a compact voice recorder that fits into your daily life, whether it's for meetings, lectures, discussions, or interviews. Where it really works wonders for me is recording calls and creating quick notes for future projects, like brainstorming video ideas. Just press one button and boom, it's recording. Super easy, super intuitive. But the magic happens after. Plod Note doesn't just stop at recording. It processes the audio into text using your choice of GBT 40 or Claude 3.5 Sonnet. Both are solid, but GPT-40 is a bit quicker, especially if you're dealing with longer recordings. The transcription is spot on and it even throws in speaker labels, which is a game changer for meetings, and it gets better. Plot Note syncs flawlessly with both its mobile app and web platforms, so whether I'm on my phone or laptop, all my recordings and transcripts are right there. Sharing them super easy, plus it supports all the formats you want for exporting files. You can even crop the audio right in the app. Perfect for those times you only need part of a conversation. And switching devices, no problem. Start on your phone, finish on your laptop. It's all synced through the cloud. Oh, and did I mention the free 300 minute advanced AI membership every month? That's more than enough for most people. So if you want the powerful tool to capture your ideas and keep everything organized, hit the link in the description and unlock the potential of Plot Note. The real differences between these three phones are all on the inside. And I'm not about to bore you with benchmarks or hardcore gaming tests. We already know all these phones handle that stuff just fine. None of them have performance issues. Everything's fast, responsive, and snappy as ever. They've all got eight gigs of RAM, which is the minimum for Apple intelligence, and they're all using three nanometer chips. So what's the catch? Well, comes down to those extra cores in the A18 Pro chip. And you know what those extra cores are mostly for? 4K 120 FPS slow-mo videos. Yep, that's the big perk. And let me tell you, it's worth it. The quality of these slow-mo videos is so good. 4K on its own doesn't wow me anymore, but the fact that this phone can shoot in 4K slow-mo with Dolby Vision, that's next level. And the coolest part, you can adjust the speed of the video anytime after you've shot it. Want to keep it in real time? No problem. Want to slow it down to one-fifth of the original speed? 
easy. But, and this is important, only the pro models can do that. And it's all thanks to new main camera sensor that processes info twice as fast. Before you get too hyped though, this only applies to the main camera. All the other cameras, they're recording just like last year's iPhone. So unless you're seriously into shooting high-res slow-mo, the videos you get from the regular iPhone 16 are gonna be just as solid. And for anyone wondering, what about log? I'll just say, who cares? Most regular users definitely don't. These pro features are for actual pros. And for 95% of you watching this, that stuff shouldn't even be on the radar. On paper, the 16 Pro and Pro Max seem like they should wipe the floor with the regular 16. But in real life, not so much. Let's start with the main camera. All these phones use the same processing algorithms, so unless you are really zooming in and analyzing every pixel, the photos are gonna look pretty much identical. This even holds up in low light situations. Sure, the 16 Pro might capture slightly more detail, but trust me, the difference isn't big enough to justify choosing one over the other based on that alone. Where you will notice a difference is the ultra-wide lens. The 16 Pro is packing a new 48 megapixel sensor, while the regular 16 is still rocking that old 12 megapixel one. The result is that the ultra-wide photos on the 16 Pro are sharper, especially when you zoom in. But, and this is important, without zooming in, the difference is almost non-existent. The same story applies to macro shots. All three phones can do macros now, which is a big deal, especially since the regular iPhones could never pull that off before. They all look fantastic, but yeah, the pros will give you a bit more detail. I also noticed a slight vignette in effect on the pro models, which isn't there on the regular 16. Now, when it comes to zoom photos, let's clear this up. There's no zoom lens on the regular iPhone 16. The 2x zoom you see is software doing its thing. The 16 Pro has the same software-based 2x zoom, and honestly, the shots are identical at 2x, but the 16 Pro also has a 5x zoom lens, and this is where it gets interesting. Apple gave both the 16 Pro and Pro Max the same 5x zoom this year. Last year, only the Max had 5x, while the smaller Pro had 3x. There were definitely some benefits to that old setup, but as someone who looks playing around with cameras, I'm stoked to have 5X in both models now. That said, here's something to keep in mind. Between 2X and 5X, the phone relies on machine learning to fill in the gaps. So don't expect to read tiny text at 4.5X or 4.9X. It's not gonna be crystal clear. On 3X, the effect isn't super noticeable, but at anything above that, especially near 5X, you're gonna see it. The regular 16 does the same thing, except it's all software past 2X. Just something to keep in mind before you start zooming away. And the way you interact with the camera is also exactly the same across all three. Yeah, I'm talking about the new camera control button. I know Apple doesn't call it a button, but come on, it clicks, it feels like a button, so I'm calling it a button. Now, it's identical on all three phones. Same size, same placement, so the user experience is basically the same. But from my time testing these, I gotta say the 16 Pro Max feels better suited for it. Because of the bigger size, the button's more reachable whether you are in portrait or landscape mode. I don't have to awkwardly bend my finger to use it. On the regular 16 and 16 Pro, it's a bit less comfortable, still works fine, just not as ergonomic. Let's be real, you're probably not too concerned about button placement. The real question is, is it even useful? Short answer, well, yeah, it can be. At first, I was just using it for zooming in, which is cool, but then I realized using it to control tone is way more helpful. The new tone control feature basically lets you adjust the contrast in photos on the fly. I like to keep mine set to around minus 0.5 or minus 0.7, makes the photos pop more and feel way less flat. So for me, tone control is where this button really shines. The second thing I use it for is styles. Apple changed styles this year and they've got a much deeper impact in your photos now. With the new styles, I can give my shots a film-like vibe, which is super cool when I want something that stands out a bit more. As for the action button, yeah, it's the same across all three models, but I'm not gonna dive into that here because we all know what that's about at this point. Like I said earlier, these three phones are super similar. And the similarities go even further when you look at what they don't have yet. 
Apple Intelligence. We are in October now, so those features should be dropping soon, but as of today, there is still no new Siri, no write-in tools, no image playground, nothing. It's a bit disappointing. Even visual intelligence, which is supposed to use the new camera control button, isn't here yet, but when these features finally roll out, they will be the same on all three phones. They will work just as fast, and no matter which iPhone 16 you get, you will be right at the edge of tech. As for battery life, no surprises here. I use all three of these as my daily drivers, and I've got a pretty clear picture of how long they last. The iPhone 16 and 16 Pro don't last a full day for me. They both tap out around the same time. The 16 Pro Max, though, easily got me through a full day, which for me is a big deal breaker. So, which one should you buy? If you can handle a big phone and your hands and pockets are up for the challenge, I'd say go for the 16 Pro Max. It's the best all-around option, especially if you need that extra battery life. But if you're not a power user and don't plan on shooting full-blown movies with your iPhone, the 16 Plus could be a great alternative. I don't have it here with me, but it's got a similar battery life to the Pro Max and packs all the features of the regular 16. Now, the 16 Pro is in a bit of a weird spot this year. Sure, it's most capable than ever, but also feels a little forced. If you are all about having the best iPhone camera and you don't care too much about battery life, the 16 Pro is a solid pick. But if you're just looking for a new iPhone to take advantage of Apple intelligence, you are cool with 60 hertz and only two cameras, grab the regular iPhone 16. You won't regret it. Honestly, I could switch to the 16 and get by just fine, aside from that battery life, of course. And what if there was a third way? And you all know what I'm about to say. 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max. I will keep it brief. The 15 Pro retails for around $770, $800 on Amazon and 15 Pro Max for $990. And these phones will have almost the same stuff as the 16 Pro and improving 16 in almost every way. No camera control though. And if you are leaning towards Pro iPhones but don't know which one to get, we just made a great video comparing 16 Pro, 15 Pro and 14 Pro. So be sure to check it out. Just click right here. Thanks for watching and I will see you there.